Coming up on Animalia, the Australian sheep that are worth their weight in gold. Dinner time at this Thai temple is a very catty affair. India's paddy fields come alive with the thunderous stamping of hooves. Could this be the most important fish in the world? Scientists say yes. And the geese are on the go in sunny Spain. Barely two years after he was born, captive Philippine eagle Kabayan is set to be released next month from his cage at the Philippine Eagle Center in Malagas, Davao, southern Philippines. The Philippine eagle is critically endangered with its population down to an estimated 500 bears. Aside from breeding and research, the center and its volunteers regularly hold bird shows at a nearby bird park to educate the public. The show calls attention to the plight of birds which are indiscriminately shot in the wild. The decrease in population is also a result of shrinking forest cover. The captive Philippine eagles, also known as monkey-eating eagles, used to be fed live chickens before the outbreak of the bird flu virus. But to reduce the possibility of being infected, they're now given freshly slaughtered chickens and fresh fish. The Philippines remains free from the deadly strain of the disease, due in part to the tough stance taken by the government. Aside from poultry imports, the Philippines has also banned imports of parrots, eagles and other exotic birds. While it's not the largest eagle in existence today, the Philippine eagle is undoubtedly the tallest and holds the world record for wingspan, which can exceed eight feet across. So far, 13 eaglets have been born and bred as part of the center's conservation breeding program. According to information officer Tatit Kiblat, the main mission is to set free the offspring of their captive birds to help complement the dwindling population in the wild. The center is expecting three more Philippine eaglets to come out of their shells soon, while the youngest chick they're currently caring for was born a month ago. Hampered by lack of funds to conserve the endangered species, the center is putting them up for adoption. Each eaglet reportedly requires close to $2,000 US dollars annually for its upkeep. It's hoped the bird shows will not only attract tourists, but donors as well. The sooner the center can afford to keep the Philippine eaglets that it breeds, the sooner they can release the rare birds into the wild. Germany's Hagenbeck Zoo was founded in 1848 when a man named Karl Hagenbeck Jr. didn't know what to do with a pair of seals his eccentric father brought back from one of his many overseas adventures. The annual stock taking at the famous zoo created some serious challenges for the keepers as they tried to count, measure and weigh more than 2,500 animals from 360 different species. The job's important since the regular checks ensure the animal's well-being, but sometimes it's hard work. It took several men and women to carry a giant turtle to the scale which showed a hefty 170 kilos once the creature was finally swinging from the ropes. The zoo's other turtles looked on rather nervously as they awaited their turn at dangling precariously from the same contraption. Little Candy's caretakers were especially pleased by the progress the baby Asian elephant had made over the past year. Candy was the first of her kind to ever be born within a herd in Germany, in just the same way an elephant calf would be born and cared for by all the female elephants in the wild. According to the zoo, Candy had grown about half a meter since they last measured her. The sight of an elephant being sized up had visitors amused and a little puzzled as well. The llama count came next and the gentle pack animals made life easy for their keeper. 
Llamas are such curious creatures that they were happy to just stand in one spot and watch him do his duty. Unfortunately, the same couldn't be said for the flaming flamingos. Their poor minder kept losing track, and when one of his colleagues suggested that he count their legs and divide by two, he wasn't very impressed. Flamingos have longer necks and legs in proportion to body size than any other kind of bird. They're herbivorous, surviving solely on blue-green algae with a filter feeding mechanism that's more similar to the southern right whale than any other animal. Female flamingos will lay a single white egg, which both parents incubate for 28 to 30 days. The chick is then fed a bright red secretion formed by glands in the mother's upper digestive tract that's rich in blood. Parents know their own young by their voice, and even in flocks of over a million birds will only feed their own offspring. And just for the record, the final count came to 130 pink flamingos, or thereabouts. Finally, it was time for the camel weigh-in, which sounds like quite a chore, but thanks to a huge weigh bridge at the back of the zoo, there's really nothing to it. Of course, having a snack while standing on a weigh bridge mightn't be the smartest thing to do, but nobody ever claimed that camels were very smart. And after a bit of fine-tuning of those enormous scales, the news isn't all that good. It seems that someone's been storing a bit too much fat in their humps. Time to take a nice long walk back to the camel enclosure and no more carrots. A bale of wool estimated to be worth over one million dollars was safe under armed guard at a bank vault in Brisbane in the Australian state of Queensland. The Australian Wool Testing Authority certified the wool as 11.9 microns thick, the finest bale of wool ever tested in Australia and possibly the world. This is the four minute mile for the wool industry according to Rick Goodrich, who with his brother Bim owns the Queensland property on which the unique sheep were raised. The brothers say their flock is extremely pampered, but won't reveal any more. However, it's rumoured the sheep are fed on a special diet while listening to soothing music. The million dollar bale will be auctioned on the world market within the next few weeks. For decades, a group of Buddhist monks at the Ang Tong Temple, a hundred kilometres north of Bangkok, have taken in stray cats, carrying them home to feed and shelter them. Monks at the temple are not concerned that the deadly bird flu virus could harm their feline friends. To prove their point, a dozen monks sat down with over a hundred stray cats at a banquet lunch consisting of fish, rice and beef, although chicken was noticeably absent from the menu. The temple spends about 900 baht, or 220 US dollars a month, to feed the stray cats, but said it was not enough, and therefore cats were hungry and would still hunt the local wild birds. Only recently, three domestic cats died in Thailand of the same deadly bird flu virus that's killed at least 22 people and 100 million chickens in Asia. Health experts are concerned about the bird flu infecting other animals, as it could prompt mutations in the virus that in turn could make it easier to pass on to people. Prime Minister Shinawatra asked pet lovers to stay calm, but urged them not to feed stray or domestic animals uncooked chicken. It wasn't an easy message for the Thai people to take in. They love their cats, and thousands of strays live with humans in impoverished rural and urban areas, especially around temples. After all, Thailand is the fabled birthplace of the prized Siamese cat. The temple's abbot has now promised to employ more hygienic practices when dealing with the strays. Surfers and a handful of sunbathers had to share Copacabana Beach with some unexpected visitors as two whales cavorted off Brazil's Rio de Janeiro coast. A female southern right whale and a calf frolicked some 50 meters from the beach, pausing in front of Rio's traditional Copacabana Palace Hotel and drawing an instant crowd of schoolchildren, tourists and fishermen to watch the show. 
Environmentalists in particular were happy to see the return of the right whale, which was almost hunted to extinction, but is now being seen again along the Brazilian coast. The southern right whale can grow up to 18 meters long and weigh over 100 tons. The leviathans migrate north from Antarctica to mate from July to November off the coast of Brazil, South Africa and Australia. Lifeguards circle the mother and calf in boats trying to draw them away from the beach. Other whales have run aground here before and they're keen to avoid that from happening again, especially as so few remain in our oceans. As summer begins to sizzle in India and Onam, the harvest festival, gets underway, the paddy fields are soon overrun by locals and their strongest, swiftest bullocks. Usually busy ploughing these fields, the men and their beasts are preparing for the maramadi, or bullock races, which have become synonymous with the Kakur region near the city of Cochin. The ox racing is the Formula One of the pre-motor car era, except here they measure bullock power, not horsepower. In no time at all, the murky fields come alive with the thunderous noise of hooves. One charge and a thrilling 80-meter sprint through mud and water begins. The teams comprise of two bullocks and three men to control them. One of the handlers needs to run ahead of the animals to guide them along the track. Each of the 50 or so teams gets to run three times and the average time decides who the eventual winner will be. At first, this competition was a four-day affair, but so many people now come from around the country to see it that organizers have turned it into a week-long festival. And while these races, for the most part, are a reflection on the past, the only modern-day concession that's been allowed is a stopwatch in order to get the most accurate times possible. But the festival has not been free of controversy. Animal rights activists approached the High Court to seek a ban on what they called a cruel sport. Fortunately for the locals, the court disagreed and has allowed the racing to proceed under the watchful eyes of court-appointed officials. Monkeys spend most of their time leaping around the tops of the trees, either with the help of their arms or by swinging from their long tails. But one monkey named Arsi at Israel's Monkey Park did it a bit differently, with a tilted head. Vets soon realized that something was wrong, and a CAT scan confirmed it. The poor little primate managed to get water in the bone next to his inner ear, and the only way to help him was to operate. Tel Aviv's Tel Hashoma Hospital came to the rescue, and Dr. Cronenberg offered to do the procedure which he usually reserves for his human patients. The whole thing was so unusual that he didn't even know how to best position the monkey before getting started. According to Dr. Cronenberg, the fluid in Arsi's middle ear was probably the result of a viral infection. A small hole was carefully cut in the tympanic membrane and the trapped water was then able to drain out. The monkey has since regained his balance and is recovering nicely, but still being kept in isolation until he fully heals. It won't be long before he rejoins his family and friends back at the monkey park. The Kenya National Museum in the Kenyan capital Nairobi is now home to a living fossil, an adult coelacanth, which was captured off the Kenyan coast of Malindi earlier this year. A coelacanth is a fish that was believed to be extinct 60 million years ago. Not only does it still exist today, but it's now believed to be a member of a primitive group of fishes that have been around for 400 million years. The capture of this marine curiosity was received with a lot of surprise by the scientific community, who've called it the most important fish in the world. An adult coelacanth can grow to at least 180 centimeters in length and weigh 98 kilograms. This particular one is slightly over 150 centimeters and weighs 77 kilograms. It's been estimated to be around 10 to 20 years old.
The fish is currently under preservation and will be put on display in the next few months. One of its most amazing features is its skull, which is in two separate parts. A strong pair of muscles beneath the skulls lowers the front half to the back half, giving it an extremely powerful bite. The coelacanth is the only living animal with this type of structure. According to the fisherman who accidentally made the amazing catch off the shores of Malindi, the fish behaved very aggressively and they decided to keep it because of its uniqueness. Models of this lobe-finned living fossil will also be made and sent to museums all around the world. And speaking of ancient marine life, the first full-scale replica of a prehistoric supercroc has been unveiled at an Australian museum. The 11 meter long flesh on bone replica of Sarcosuchus imperator or supercroc which lived about 110 million years ago is the brainchild of US paleontologist Paul Sereno. It was Sereno who discovered the most extensive array of supercroc remains ever found during a dig sponsored by the National Geographic Society in Niger several years ago. On that dig, Sereno discovered supercroc vertebrae, limb bones, armor plating, jaws, and a nearly intact 1.8 meter skull. One of the largest crocodiles that ever lived, supercroc was as long as a city bus and could weigh up to 10,000 kilograms. With startling figures like those, it's no wonder that Sereno was inspired to reproduce the giant creature as a museum exhibit. Replica designer Gary Staub, who designs dinosaurs for museums and universities such as the Smithsonian Institute, used over 2,000 kilograms of clay along with polyester resin and fiberglass to recreate the giant killer croc. While Spaniards go mad for Pamplona's bull run, Italians choose a less dangerous form of animal racing to pass the time. A gaggle of townsfolk and their respective geese gathered in the small northwestern village of Murano as they do each year to take part in the annual Goose Palio, inspired by Siena's famous bareback horse race. In a flurry of pre-race nerves, some of the 150 geese due to take part in the sprint were going through their waddling moves just one last time after months of serious training. Others were content to wait it out in their cages until the big moment arrived. While last year's winner, Spartacus, just seemed happy to wing it. Word on the grapevine was that Spartacus had grown fat over the past year and hadn't been training very much. He's also been living the good life after having 34 children since his big win. Oresti, one of Spartacus's youngest offspring, is tipped as race favourite this year. Even the children take it seriously. Dressed as birds and gathering around to hear training tips that may come in handy once they are old enough to race birds themselves. At the starting line, competitors go over the rules one last time. Goose prodding is strictly prohibited. Willow sticks can only be used to tap the ground in an effort to urge the birds to waddle faster. A race marshal with a whistle runs ahead of the field to warn spectators to get out of the way of the fast approaching flock as men, women, boys, girls, geese, ganders and goslings hurl themselves along the 419 meter stretch of racing roadway to the finish line. Unfortunately, Many of the geese don't play by the rules and prefer taking their own path, followed by the frantic screams of their owners. This year there was some controversy when the first goose past the post was disqualified for being helped over the line by an over-eager owner, leaving nine-year-old Stefano Camaletto and his goose Margarita as the race winners. Margarita covered the course in just under six minutes, while a breathless Stefano wants to thank his granddad for helping him. As the late arrivals slowly crossed the line, they seemed to have a worried look in their eyes. Goose liver pate was rumored to be on the menu for lunch. The producers of Animalia would like to warn sensitive viewers that some scenes of this story could be offensive.
The zigzagging fox makes a last desperate dash across a snow-covered valley before it's attacked by the golden eagle. Cheers burst out from the hundreds of people watching the hunt from the nearby slopes. It may not be a welcome sport for sensitive urban dwellers or environmentalists, but on the fast steps of the once nomadic Kazakhstan, age-old hunting with a golden eagle is being revived with pride and is looked at as traditional art. 23-year-old Altai Muntikyov has been training his golden eagle for a year. He took the bird when it was small and raised it. Altai named the bird Dal, which means whirlwind. The bird is just two years old. It's well fed and well bred. Altai first fed the eagle by hand, then trained it to chase meat wrapped in fox fur. If the training goes well, hunting can commence quite early. Altai is among dozens of hunters who take part in the annual eagle hunting event in Isik, about 40 kilometers from capital Almaty. The falcons, harriers and golden eagles get through their first exercise quickly. They chase down hares that are released one by one into the snow-covered field. Most of the animals are doomed. Nearly all of the participants in the hunting are men, but this is gradually changing. Makpal from the city of Karaganda is the first woman to take part in the activity. She's only 15 and says her father taught her the art of eagle hunting. She's neither afraid of horses nor of the golden eagle, having been in the saddle since three. She was named overall winner of the first eagle hunting contest last year, defeating much older and more experienced men. But Mark Pal failed to win this year. In ancient times, eagle hunting was largely the domain of Khans who ruled these endless steppes. But the sport was nearly forgotten under harsh Soviet rule. Now, after gaining independence in 1991, Kazakhstan is trying to bring back some of its lost but cherished past. <laughs> Matasa, 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 Matasa,